Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, come to you after a uh, busy uh, week for the government, and just highlighting again, uh, since Thursday, uh, the announcement in particular, uh, uh, alongside Minister Martin and myself, of the Child and Youth Wellbeing Strategy. Uh, and alongside that, the introduction of food in schools, which will begin in the beginning of 2020. Uh, then, of course, the announcement around our Cancer Action Plan, which was made in Auckland yesterday. Both of these issues signal uh, the ongoing focus of the government on long-term issues that often uh, will require sustained action uh, and long-term commitment from us, be it issues of child poverty, or ongoing underinvestment in our health system. Uh, but I think both the Cancer Action Plan and our Child and Youth Wellbeing Strategy demonstrate that we are looking beyond three-year cycles, out to even as far as 30 years in terms of addressing some of those significant issues. And again, whilst it will take time, in both cases I think we've made um, very, very good starts. But starting with the recess uh, week ahead, just a little recap of some of the um, uh, initiatives I'll be a part of. Tomorrow I'll be visiting uh, the East Coast as part of the Ngāti Puro uh, Crown um, Taumata. Uh, you might recall that's something we undertake on an annual basis and my commitment last year was that we would travel further um, and beyond um, Gisborne uh, into the wider area. On Wednesday I am in Auckland. I'll be speaking uh, at the Waiata album launch in the evening. On Thursday I'll travel to Dunedin for some business visits and to speak at the ODT Class Act Awards and at a uh, government CTU forum. On Friday, I'm back in Auckland for an electric um, day. Uh, on the weekend, I'll be involved in a mental health announcement alongside uh, Minister Clark. Uh, elsewhere, the government also has a busy week and will deliver on several major pieces of work. Uh, Heather Simpson's interim review of the health system will be released on Tuesday. The Kiwi Build Reset on Wednesday from Minister Woods. Our water reforms on Thursday from Minister Parker and O'Connor. A PGF Northland Rail announcement on Friday from Minister Jones. Uh, I know you will uh, ask soon, but I can confirm now that I'll be not releasing any further details on any of those initiatives uh, ahead of time. Uh, from um, Sunday and then throughout the following week, we will be making a series of mental health announcements and it will be quite a concerted focus uh, in this week on mental health initiatives. Now, as you can see, I have Ashley Bloomfield, the Director General of Health, here with me today. Um, as you will know, we are currently experiencing unusually high rates of measles infections uh, in Auckland, predominantly uh, in South Auckland. And as you know by now, I've been saying it repeatedly, immunisation is the best way to fight this outbreak and prevent outbreaks elsewhere. This morning's update tells us there have been 963 confirmed cases since this outbreak began in March. This is an increase of four since Sunday's situation report. Of course, uh, there may well be uh, additional reports in from uh, the weekend, but that is the situation as it stands. At present, the only place we consider there to be an outbreak is Auckland, and particularly, as I've said, South Auckland. Today, Cabinet was updated on the measles outbreak and heard that the Ministry has been training 25 additional nurses to administer vaccines in 34 Auckland schools that the Associate Health Minister, Julianne Genta, has asked for the Ministry of Health uh, to look uh, at the possibility of pharmacists being able to administer measles vaccinations. But keeping in mind, of course, access has been a key focus for the Ministry of Health to date. Uh, and of course, um, people are able to access free measles vaccinations through their local GP. So that, uh, and also there's been outreach uh, community clinics um, uh, community clinics are available in the Monaco Super Clinic and the Clendon Shopping Centre. And we've even, for instance, uh, made use of churches in South Auckland to try and make sure that we are present. We are those who we need to target vaccinations for are present as well. One thing I do want to note, though, is that this situation is not unique to New Zealand. Since 2012, all cases of measles here originated from travellers bringing the disease from overseas. 
uh, there are currently significant <coughs> measles outbreaks overseas. As at 23 August, there are current outbreaks reported in Hong Kong, Philippines, Europe, Canada, the USA, Australia, and Southeast Asia. Preliminary global data from the World Health Organization shows that reported cases of measles rose by almost 300% in 2019, compared to the same period in 2018. That information serves to underline the importance of us focusing on immunizing uh, those who particularly are in those outbreak areas. And again, I remind people, the vaccine is free for those under the age of 50 who have not had two documented doses. I also remind people to stay at home if you're feeling sick, have symptoms that include fever, cough, runny nose, and sore water, pink eyes, and calling the 0800 611 116 Healthline. That's 0800 611 116 Healthline. Or your doctor if you think you or a family member may have needs. <coughs> Actually, is there anything you wish to add before we open for questions? Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. I do want to emphasise that the only area in the country where we do have an outbreak at the moment is the Auckland <coughs> region. As you will know, and as the Prime Minister has said, that is focused in South Auckland, and that is where the focus of additional vaccination opportunities is currently. It's a uh, vaccine is free for under 50s, the focus being, of course, on children as part of the routine <coughs> childhood immunisation schedule. And the most important thing outside of Auckland is that children are vaccinated with this highly effective, very safe vaccine and that they receive that vaccination on time. All right, we'll open for questions. Have some health officials moved move too slow to get the message out to the public that in So uh, I don't think they have moved too slowly. I think there's been good information out there. There are daily press conferences, of course, now uh, by the Medical Officer of Health, Dr. William Ranger, up there. The decision about events uh, falls with event organisers, and they can discuss and get advice from the Medical Officer of Health the public and the Public Health Unit, but it does fall with event organisers. They should and are uh, finding out whether there are students who are unimmunised and making a decision themselves about whether either to exclude students or to proceed with an event or not. My understanding is that very clear advice has been given locally from those medical professionals to event organisers, asking questions of participants like, for instance, whether or not they're being immunised. And that means that those event organisers then have full information available to them in order to ascertain whether or not um, it would be wise under the circumstances to proceed. <coughs> what are some of the other high-risk areas so we do have other areas of the country with low immunisation rates, MMR immunisation rates, um, in particular Northland, and you will be aware that the Chief uh, Executive of the um, uh, DHB up there has already uh, been very clear about the need for uh, children to be immunised up there. I think there is a high level of awareness and a high level of um, responsiveness from the healthcare system. Uh, I'll be writing to uh, primary health organisations and the College of GPs uh, later today, which will get to go out tomorrow, just to remind them of the importance of GPs recalling uh, children to have their vaccinations on time and of getting information out, good information out to parents. There is this issue uh, that is well canvassed around anti-vaxxers and this notion that the WHO calls vaccine hesitancy. I want to distinguish between vaccine hesitancy and vaccine opposition. Our experience in New Zealand previously, when we had lower rates of immunisation, was that if we made the vaccine readily available and we provided good information to parents, then the vast majority of them, up to 95% and even beyond, were quite happy to vaccinate their children. And that's the situation we want to return to. In terms of outbreak, um, just to reinforce um, what the Director General has said, um, in, those, uh, in the last two weeks, up to the 30th of August, we had a uh, recorded number of cases in Northland that amounted to six. Um, uh, but when you track down into Waitamata, um, into Auckland, into Counties Manukau, Counties Manukau has had 188. So uh, the scale is definitely significant um, in that area. Um, you can see that in the way that the Ministry of Health is really scaling up 
uh, being very proactive and going into those community places like you know, a church facility, for instance. Um, but that doesn't mean we should be complacent in those other areas like Northland. Do we have any anti-vax GPs in New Zealand? Uh, not every GP and not every health professional supports vaccination. However, there is an obligation on all health professionals, and particularly GPs and those dealing with uh, parents and young children, to provide good, balanced information and ensure that they are making available vaccination for children who are eligible. Can you mentioned vaccine hesitation as opposed to vaccine opposition. Where do you categorise us on that scale? Do you well, uh, let's be clear, we still have, and I've got the latest figures, uh, nearly 91% of two-year-olds have received their MMR vaccination across the country. So the vast majority, nine out of 10 children, are actually vaccinated. It's the getting from that 90 to 95 is where we need to be for herd immunity. We have got there or thereabouts before, and that's where we want to go back to. Again, our experience is that the gap between 90 and 95 is not an issue of opposition, it's an issue of access and of really good information so that parents feel they're making the right decision. Why do you think it is that the percentage drops have dropped at since 2016 by 20 points? Yeah, and one of the issues that actually has been raised, and we've asked this question, one, one of the issues that's been raised with us, and you'll hear in uh, the comments made by the Director General, have been that issue around access. And it's the same issue that we have in our health system generally. We have and inequality and equity issues with people accessing the health services um, that they not only deserve, but that are made available to them and for free. Uh, and so that's why um, the Ministry of Health acted to put those additional nurses out into, into places where people who we need to target are congregating, be it churches or community spaces, um, because we have identified that there is an equity issue. Um, particularly our Pacific Island community haven't been accessing those immunisations at the rate that we need to um, in counties Manukau. What's the government's <coughs> advice when it comes to um, school children that have been vaccinated? Are you saying that um, if a school child hasn't been vaccinated they should stay home or? No, so the only, um, ultimately those decisions are uh, um, up to our health professions uh, at a public health level, at a regional level. Um, and uh, that's a decision that once they make is then communicated with the school. Um, at this point in time, my understanding is that that, uh, that message hasn't been given. Um, but of course, we know uh, those questions are asked at enrolment, so schools generally know the level of immunisation that they have. As I've said, uh, we are training actively now nurses to go into schools um, to uh, make sure that those children who haven't been immunised um, particularly in that bracket of 15 to 29, I believe it is, um, to make sure that we're accessing that target group. So you say the principal shouldn't be telling the students to stay home? With no, I'm saying that actually by, by law, that sits with health rather than with education. So that's something that is a responsibility of health. How so likely is it that we'll see pharmacists administering those vaccinations? Well, I think at the, at the moment, um, my understanding is that, um, uh, of course, they um, cannot um, access um, the National Immunisation Register, which, as you can imagine, is a really key piece of information to be able to successfully um, answer the public's questions over whether or not they need to be immunised. Um, that's what one particular issue, but actually we need to ask the question, are people unable to currently access immunisation? Um, it's free, it's available through their GP. We're also putting in community clinics and people into schools, uh, and so we're actively addressing um, access issues. So the question is, um, it is our pharmac pharmacists um, needed in addition to that? Um, that's something that the Ministry of Health is looking at, but again, there are a few hurdles to overcome. What well, makes this different? Did you want to add to that though? Yes, if I can, yeah. there are two or three issues we would need to work through to enable pharmacists to vaccinate for uh, MMR. At the moment, the only publicly funded vaccine they can give is influenza vaccine in those eligible groups. They do provide um, uh, other vaccines where people pay privately if they're registered vaccinators. So there are two or three things, as the Prime Minister said, we would need to open up access to the National Immunisation Register for MMR, for pharmacists, and also develop a payment mechanism because at the moment there's no private market for MMR. These are things we're actively looking at. Mm. So on the opposition um, versus the, uh, you're saying that basically you still obtain the What's the 
uh, the, the uh, herd immunity will be achieved if we achieve around the 95% vaccination rate. You don't believe we'll be fine to leave the country out and take Our experience is, and I've uh, specialised in public health, and when we had low vaccination rates through the 90s and into the early 2000s, we put in a huge effort uh, with the establishment of the National Immunisation Register, immunisation coordinators and outreach, and we got very close to 95%. An interesting thing was the voice of the anti-vaccine uh, lobby got much quieter. And in fact, what we found was that on average across the country, it was 5% or less of people who actively opposed vaccinating their children. So it's that gap between, at the moment we're 91, between 91 and 95, and we believe we can close that with good information and making sure there is ready access. Have things changed since then though? Well, there has been a change, you're right, and the film, films like the, the Vaxxed movie have, mm -hmm. are out there. But again, I think our experiences, and I can recall through the, through the late 90s, there was a very loud anti-immunisation lobby, and by actively going out and putting the building blocks in and being prepared to go and outreach to groups that may not be accessing through primary care, using vaccinators who were of that ethnic group, Māori or Pacific, we were able to get vaccination rates up very high. Can you just confirm all of those sort of recent contracted people um, weren't immunised at all? Yes, they were not. 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 So, yes, that's, that's correct. The vast majority of cases uh, were people who had either been unimmunised or had had only one dose or were unsure about their immunisation status. What do you mean vast majority? You will, because the, the vaccine, even after two doses, uh, it's about 99% of people will develop immunity. So very, very few vaccines are 100% uh, of people will develop immunity. So it is possible for fully vaccinated people to get measles, but it's extremely unlikely. The, the vast majority of cases today have been people who are unsure of their vaccine status or were unvaccinated. So keeping, in mind, so keeping in mind that the National Immunisation Register has only been in place since 2000 and Around 2004. And I imagine in some cases then we may be relying on people's recall as to, as to whether or not they've been immunised or have two doses. Um, because of course we'll be relying on what records we would have nationally um, as well. So that, that obviously complicates um, complicates potentially the data set. So exactly how many people have had their NMR vaccine and contracted I don't have that specific number, but we, we do collect that and I can we can look for that data. Uh, ESR will have it and we've now got two uh, uh, of the team members from ESR are in our National Health Coordination Centre here at the Ministry, so we'll be able to find that out. We're in the life cycle of this outbreak, and I don't imagine this Yes, it is still trending up. We do have a, a, an epidemic curve model based on known vaccination rates, the number of doses that have been delivered and the current pattern of spread. We're expecting it to keep going up for another week or two and then to peak and drop away. It's very important that we therefore keep focusing on immunising uh, children and that 15 to 29 year age group in the Auckland region in particular, and particularly in South Auckland, uh, to uh, stop the current outbreak. Yes, actually we didn't model the numbers per se, just the timing time of when the peak would be and the time the, the expected timing is in around two weeks' time. So we will continue to see um, these numbers track through for the next fortnight. Um, that's what the, the model suggests, but that does rely on us alongside that, continuing to immunise those groups in particular um, that the Director General has acknowledged we need to, that we need to make sure are, are immunised. Prime Minister, on Mount Taylor. Oh, anything, anything further? Will, yes. um, will the measles outbreak reach epidemic portions in those two weeks? Well, at the moment, uh, we have an outbreak uh, that is focused in the Auckland metro region. It would only be classified as an epidemic if we had multiple outbreaks across different parts of the country. We are having sporadic cases in other parts of the country, all associated either with, um, with exposure to someone from Auckland or with travel to Auckland, or with a case being imported from overseas. So we're not at epidemic uh, level yet, but we are very focused on 
um, addressing the outbreak in Auckland and preventing outbreaks elsewhere. Okay, thank you. On the issue of Mark Taylor, is there pressure from the US for us to do something? I've, look, I've seen the public statements from um, the United States around foreign terrorist fighters that apply from their perspective, not just to New Zealand, but of course to anyone who's uh, identified as having foreign terrorist fighters in camps in Syria. Uh, I've um, not personally had conversations beyond what I've seen publicly reported, but New Zealand's position has been very, very clear from the outset. The reason we gave such clear advice uh, around New Zealand is not travelling to Syria uh, was because of what we're seeing exactly happen now, that there is an individual uh, who is now in a camp uh, where we do not have uh, consular assistance available and where it would come at risk to provide that assistance. Do you feel comfortable leaving him in Syria? I think that the um, messages uh, have been utterly clear and unequivocal. Um, A, do not travel to Syria and B, do not engage in terrorist activity. You talk about risks, risks in Bhutan, what are those risks? Oh, well, obviously it's still a very volatile area, very volatile region, and that of course comes with risks to um, uh, New Zealand um, personnel uh, or um, uh, those who otherwise might usually provide consular assistance. Really well, the updates on the cases of the huge news in Syria? Well, the addition of a rent, I was seeing uh, you will have um, heard that I've just mentioned that we'll be making announcements around the uh, Kiwi Build reset on uh, Wednesday, and I will be f commenting further until the ministers have a chance to, a uh, uh, to do that. Sorry, could you give us a bit of an update about Western Peter's condition? He had surgery, but we haven't seen him around. No, my, uh, my understanding is that the Deputy Prime Minister has still not been cleared to fly. Um, when I last um, spoke with him around other bits and bobs that I usually catch up with him on, he was in good spirits. When is he going to be cleared to fly? Um, so I, unfortunately, I, I don't know that information. What's How the will the Probably only his doctor would be the one to ask that, that question of, so sorry, I, I can't tell you that. How is the government planning to respond to the Waitangi report on water, and what will be the key points that the government will be wanting to make in that response? Yeah, well, I think, you know, obviously there, are, there have been two issues in particular. Uh, we will already know the government's position. Um, the Waitangi Tribunal hasn't necessarily factored in the, the work program that we've had around water quality, um, but of course we'll be making further announcements on that on Thursday. And I think that will demonstrate that we are making um, good progress uh, uh, on some of the areas that the Waitangi Tribunal highlight. Um, on the issue of water allocation, that's something that we've said um, we've prioritised water quality, the ability for people to be able to swim in their rivers um, to stop the degradation and restore the quality of waterways within um, a generation. That's come first for us and then we've said we'll look at the water allocation issues and so those are the, that's the timeline that we've set. Is there any chance that report back on the water allocation would come before the election next year? Uh, I would say that, that no, no, not at this stage. Um, obviously Minister Parker has talked about undertaking work um, but obviously the priority for, for him has been very much on progressing water quality, and that has been a significant piece of work. You'll also see, of course, that where the Waitangi Tribunal landed on allocation issues was not too dis... well, had some um, comparison to what Labour had talked about pre-election, but that was obviously something that did not progress past coalition negotiations. Two weeks ago, you said the uh, potential changes to prison letters could be at Cabinet by. Did you discuss that? Yeah, so I'll leave the Minister. I imagine it won't be um, too long at all before the Minister will make announcements, but it has been discussed by Cabinet um, uh, over since we uh, since I last raised it in um, post care but I'll leave it to the Minister to make formal announcements. Last yes. week you said that you had um, you'd reached out to the Brazilian government around um, any help that New Zealand could provide around the fires in the Amazon. Have you heard back from the Brazilian government or their officials? Uh, I, yes, well, in the sense that we uh, that we did raise those concerns as other um, uh, other governments have. We're certainly not uh, alone in that. Um, we have not had any requests um, for help as a consequence of that, though, is my understanding. Has the Labour Party decided we will sign up for Facebook's and Yeah, um, I've had a little look at some of what Facebook is proposing, and I think that um, that work should be applauded. Uh, we haven't uh, made any formal announcements off the back of that as yet, but it's something that, um, as I say, I think it's encouraging that Facebook have been looking in this direction. Obviously, a number of countries 
it's been something that they've set an expectation. They haven't done that yet here, but I think it's a positive move on their part, and we'll have more to say on it soon. The great part of the is that you're not under that two hours, what's taking away for so long? <laughs> as I said, we'll be, we'll be making a statement on it um, sooner rather than later, but as I've said, I think what they've done is a good move, the kind of thing that we need. Um, I just want to make sure that there's good coordination as we move forward. Why is it so important to change the Evidence Act um, to hear the parts um, that, that uh, make it more effective complaints on whips and, whips and sexual violence and family violence cases? You're making reference to the Law Commission report on yeah. the Evidence Act? Um, obviously that's something that we've just received. There's some areas that we're obviously progressing through our domestic violence and sexual violence reforms, but otherwise, <coughs> in terms of the detail and the specifics, um, we would agree that improvements need to be made, but I am uh, leaving it to the Minister to talk through some of the details on that. But that's around uh, requiring evidence of a complaint of sexual experience or questioning a witness um, in a way that might seem unacceptable. How can that affect you think that is in this? Well, it, it's something that's come up before, and you'll recall um, that the work that we've done around sexual violence, the um, way that our court <coughs> um, uh, process claims, um, deal with claims, has been raised um, uh, continuously through that process. So my understanding is that of the recommendations that have been made, a number of them we have been progressing as part of sexual violence legislation, um, and that's due to be introduced later this year. So it is something that we've actively been looking at alongside the Law Commission having already done this work. And will there still, still be a, um, a government building component to the I'm going to leave it to Minister Woods to um, expand on the Kiwi Build Reset at the time that she makes an announcement. Sorry, what was that? Can you confirm that they don't that? Uh, again, I'll leave it for obviously the Minister is making <laughs> announcements on Wednesday. Well, yeah. There are no cabinet meetings between now and then. And the name's definitely the same, same, isn't it? Again, I'm leaving it to the Minister to make announcements on Wednesday. I hate to steal their thunder. Last, last couple of questions. I'll just check. You'll forgive me, Henry, if there's any one that I've missed. Oh, of course, we engage um, uh, our confidence and supply and coalition partners throughout the um, crafting and drafting of cabinet papers and cabinet committee papers. That's our normal practice. So that engagement happens uh, well in advance um, of those papers being considered. So the Green Party now starts. I'm not going to join in speculation, and uh, nor will I confirm any of the content. Uh, of uh, the announcements that the Minister will be making on Wednesday. Can you give any update on how the... Last question, thanks, Can you give any update on how the going around the Eastern um, Obviously, I've been um, uh, keeping in, in touch, um, um, but I haven't had a, a recent um, update. Okay, thanks, everyone.